And from uh, Cathay YSS, please welcome our moderator, Dr. Jubilia de Guzman. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, moving on to our next symposium. Um, our next symposium will be by Dr. Subhankar Chowdhury. He is the professor and head of the Department of Endocrinology at the Institute of the Postgraduate Medical Research and Education and the Seth Sukhal Karnani Memorial Hospital. He is the consultant at several hospitals and clinics around Kolkata. Dr. Chowdhury had a brilliant medical re record starting from the school learning examination. He ranked second out of nearly 200,000 candidates to his masterals, DTM and H, medical and diabetes and DM courses, and earned numerous college medals, scholarships, and prizes, and is the top lister in the university final examination. He had his clinical research fellowship at the St. Vincent in United Kingdom from 1996 to 1997. Afterwards, he had many positions, including the past president of the Endocrine Society of India. He was the founder patron of the South Asian Federation of Endocrine Societies, and currently he is the president of the Endocrine Society of Bengal and the editor-in-chief of the Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism. Friends and colleagues, I would like to present Subhankar Chowdhury, Dr. Subhankar Chowdhury, who will talk on biosimilar insulin analogs, new frontiers for cost-effective and efficacious diabetes mellitus management. Let us all welcome Dr. Subhankar Chowdhury. Hi. Very good morning. Thanks for those kind words of introduction. I bring fraternal greetings from Calcutta, now known as Kolkata, in the eastern part of India. This is my second visit to Philippines, beautiful Philippines. Last time was Cebu. This time is Iloilo. It's great to be here. Uh, disclosures, uh, I have been on editorial or advisory boards and in speaker programs of different pharmaceutical uh, companies including those who have come up with innovation, innovator insulin, and also with biosimilar insulins. Now, after those two very exciting talks in the morning, we look at another important aspect of diabetes management, which we all understand is multifaceted. It has to be holistic. And we should uh, look at some ways in which you and I can together help improve diabetes management in our patients. So this is the agenda, quick overview of diabetes across the world, and especially in this part of the world. Talk about biopharmaceuticals, talk about insulin as a biopharmaceutical, and talk about biosimilars. And in this space, talk about insulin analogs. And more specifically, maybe focus on basal insulin analogs. And finally, uh, conclusion. So we all are aware of the growing problem of diabetes across the world. Fortunately, I find that in this part, actually, in the Western Pacific area, probably the projected increase in diabetes is much less than it is in my part of the world and in several other parts of the world as well. So you see only about 15% projected increase as per the IDF Atlas of 2017 projected to 2014. But nonetheless, still it remains a major health problem. And specifically, I have got out the details for Philippines. The number of people with diabetes and impaired glucose tolerance, the crude prevalence in adults, 2017 and 2045, the numbers are going to increase. In terms of percentage of people 
the increase will be about one to one and a half percent. Whether we're looking at established diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance. And that definitely will also lead to increase in healthcare expenditure related to diabetes. And for a chronic disease like diabetes, expenditure is something that we need to be concerned about, especially again in, 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 in a country where most of the payment that people have to make for their treatment is out of pocket expenses. It's not covered by the state or insurance by and large as I understand. So again, the total health care expenditure is likely to increase significantly uh, uh, from 2017 to 2045. Uh, and that's related to diabetes. And if we look at overall healthcare expenditure related to diabetes, we find that it's related partly or a significant proportion is because of the cost of hospitalization, almost one third of the cost because of hospitalization related to conditions, complications caused by or related to diabetes. About a 30% is related to treatment of complications of diabetes. So we all understand the need of the R is to prevent, try and prevent, avert, delay the onset of complications of diabetes. And then the direct cost for buying the medications for treating diabetes per se is about 10 to 15%. And then physician office visits is another 13%. So whatever way we can, we should try and reduce the burden of cost on our patients. Can, right. And in this context, we uh, sort of move over to the area of biopharmaceuticals. And what are they? They are simply drugs that contain one or few more substances produced or secreted by live cells, not just purely produced in the factory industry, but these have to be produced by live cells. The first example of a biopharmaceutical was recombinant human insulin. And actually, uh, I come from an era where we started our journey with bovine insulins. We graduated maybe to porcine insulins. Then we saw the human recombinant insulin coming in, we, we, which we thought was great. But then we also learned the limitations of human insulins, and then we wanted further, smarter insulins. And then we have come on to the age of the insulin analogs. So there are various other examples of biopharmaceuticals, which include the other insulins, the insulin analogs. It includes erythropoietin, includes monoclonal antibodies. So many of them are coming in. You, just now, we heard about the evolocumab, which is a monoclonal antibody, and so on and so forth. And what is a biosimilar? Well, a biosimilar is a copy version of already authorized biopharmaceutical, but with demonstrated similarity in physicochemical characteristics, efficacy, and safety based on a comprehensive compatibility exercise. So it's not just anything that comes out that you bring out of your bag. It has to pass through definite stringent process of proving its similarity to the originator uh, or the innovator biopharmaceuticals. And the importance here is cost. Why should we be looking for biosimilars? Because as we all understand, the, the strain on the healthcare system, strain on the individual family, the individual patient, the family in terms of cost of any chronic illness like diabetes, and cost of insulin was also significantly high. And that may be one reason that some of our patients may not agree to take insulin. So markets introduction of biosimilar insulins presents one option to lower treatment costs. 
And there have been various studies, various projections uh, as to how biosimilars could improve uh, the cost of treatment. And uh, both in the US and in Europe, there have been suggestions, economic models, which have suggested that there could be savings of significant amount of money uh, in, in dollars or in euros. And if you take a specific example of erythropoietin, which was introduced in Germany in 2017, within a short span of two years, from 20, 207 to, uh, 27 to 2010, there has been significant decline in, in the cost of erythropoietin. So if you have a biosimilar, maybe even the innovator cost may come down uh, in course of time. So we now sort of zoom into insulin analogs. We now know that because we are injecting insulin subcutaneously and not where nature primarily delivers insulin, which is from the pancreas into the portal vein, then to the liver, but we're doing the other way. First subcutaneously, then through the systemic circulation, then it will come back to the liver. So it does not exactly mimic human physiology. And that led to the quest for development of insulin analogs. And we have different types of analogs we know. So this is sort of time action profile. I'm sure you have seen similar slides several times before. And then we have uh, the NPH, the age-old, still used and still effective NPH insulin. And then we have analogs, insulin detimer, insulin glargin. And what is not shown here is insulin degludec. I understand it's also available in this country. And then we have the faster-acting analogs, insulin lispro, asport, glulysin. And now we have a fast asport also, even faster onset of action than aspart, the, the conventional aspart. And if we look at various meta-analysis, systemic reviews, this one is looking at insulin aspart as a fast-acting insulin analog. There are so, so many studies which suggest that they lead to better glucose control. Now, the better glucose control is probably not related to greater efficacy of these insulins, but maybe because these insulins lead to less hypoglycemia, so the ease of using these insulins is better. So maybe one can titrate, up-titrate the doses more easily with these insulins compared to human insulin. So this is uh, uh, various studies in type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, the relative change in A1C, if you look at the forest plot at the bottom, there tends to be an improvement in A1C, better control of A1C with aspart insulin, which is a fast-acting insulin analog. And we continue with the same story over here uh, uh, in type 2 diabetes. And this one is in type 1 diabetes, all of which uh, overall would suggest uh, better uh, insulin action and better glucose control. If you now look at glargin, which, is, which was uh, the first basal or long-acting insulin analog that was introduced, we have more analogs coming after this, but by and large, this has become uh, uh, sort of the gold standard uh, basal insulin at this point of time. And we look at pooled analysis of nine open-label randomized controlled trials in type 2 diabetes, where insulin glargin as basal insulin regimen is compared to various other treatment comparisons, including NPH insulin, uh, which was our uh, available NPH, uh, the basal insulin that we had in the past. And as we saw, NPH insulin had a significant peak and so therefore had significant high risk of hypoglycemia. And so if you look at target A1C achievement, at least this pulled data suggests that you have better achievement of A1C proportion of patients achieving A1C less than seven. Where they look at less than 65, more than 65, 65 to 74, 
uh, you, look, you, you see this better A1C achievement, but it's not shown in those above 75. But the important point, once again, whenever we use insulin or oral anti-diabetic agents is that many a time, our attempt at achieving time glucose control is affected by the risk of hypoglycemia. And so if we look at reduction of hypoglycemia, or is there a difference in hypoglycemia uh, uh, development, we see there a clear advantage of glargine compared to the other agents that were used. And again, whether it's daytime or nocturnal hypoglycemia, whether it's less than 65 or more than 65, glargine insulin fares significantly better in terms of causing less hypoglycemia, and therefore less fear in the mind of the patient and also less fear in the mind of the treating physician when we start someone on a basal insulin compared to at least NPH insulin. And again, uh, uh, there's another uh, pool data from nine uh, RCTs of more than 24 weeks duration. Again, uh, this is glargine use added on top of oral agents versus uh, adding NPH or premixed or prandial insulins. Again, it suggests that especially at the higher A1C levels, addition of glargine as a basal insulin is significantly better in terms of achieving target uh, uh, levels of A1C. The other part is, of course, cost effectiveness. So we did see that basal insulin glargine is effective and it tends to cause less hypoglycemia, but is it cost effective? And here the cost effectiveness, uh, there are different economic models to, stu uh, to study cost effectiveness. Uh, uh, one such is the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, ICER, which uh, takes into consideration not only the immediate cost of treatment, but also costs related to maybe the hospitalization for hypoglycemia following uh, institution of particular treatment. And if you compare Essentially, it's long-acting uh, uh, insulin analogs. Essentially, it, it refers to glargine and compared with NPH, number of studies, which all of which would suggest that it is cost-effective. Then if we compare against premixed analogs, against, again, most studies would suggest that it's cost-effective. If you compare with a rapid-acting analog aspirate, again, it suggests that it is cost-effective. What is important is that already the innovator basal insulin compared to these other regimens is found to be cost effective. And if we now have the advantage of biosimilar, the price advantage of a biosimilar, the cost effectiveness is likely to improve further. Of course, that assumes that the biosimilars will function as well as the innovator glargine. That's the assumption. And for that, we need actually to look at data, whether that's really the case, if the biosimilars are performing, performing as well on the ground as the innovator insulin. The challenges of biosimilar are many because biosimilar insulins, because insulin happens to be a protein molecule, it's not only got an amino acid structure, 51 amino acids, two chains, but there are twists and turns in the tail. It's it has a primary structure, it has a secondary structure, it has a tertiary structure, it has a quaternary structure. So there may be concerns about whether what we have made as a biosimilar actually has all those finer properties of the original insulin molecule. And it's quite difficult to fully characterize the molecular composition of a biosimilar molecule because, and also because it's produced by living cell cultures, which may be less amenable to controls of an industrial uh, environment than a machine that just uh, churns out uh, simple chemical molecules. And the entire thing is highly process dependent how exactly you grow your living cells, what are the conditions, the pH, the temperature, and so on and so forth. So 
those are the intricacies that need to be considered when you consider a biosimilar, which is usually a protein molecule versus the simple generic medications as we call them. So in order to mitigate, in order to ensure that what the patients get as products, as biosimilar products, there are quality checks involved. There, the evaluation process includes looking at the raw material, looking at the finished product, looking at preclinical studies, looking at clinical studies, looking at pharmacokinetic properties, pharmacodynamic properties, safety issues, all of these. And the ones uh, in green are what the innovator molecule has to show. And the biosimilars have got to show comparability data to that innovator, which has already proved its worth. And then only such a biosimilar can be accepted as fit for our patients. So these are the requirements for biosimilar. For all of these, uh, one needs to have comparability data. And as I've already mentioned, the, the challenges of biosimilars are related to the complex structure of protein molecules compared to simple inorganic uh, uh, drugs, maybe a statin or, 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 or maybe one of the oral antidiabetic agents like a gliptin. Uh, the insulin area is significantly more challenging and more so especially insulin has a relatively narrow therapeutic window. So even small changes in the pharmacokinetic or pharmacodynamic uh, properties can affect the glycemic status, either cause too, too much of hypoglycemia or allow too much of hyperglycemia. And insulin being a molecule, a protein molecule, there is always the concern of generation of antibodies. Now these antibodies could neutralize whatever insulin that you're injecting, and so the insulin may no longer work properly. So still the insulin, if you measure, there may be enough insulin in the circulation, but it may, it may not be producing its desirable action because there are neutralizing antibodies. So that's something that specially needs to be taken care of when we are studying the properties of biosimilar uh, protein molecules. So if you look at biosimilar insulins, as I mentioned, the first biosimilar insulins were all human insulins. The regular insulin, the NPH insulin, and they were pre-mixed biosimilar insulins, and which have proved, proven their worth over the years of time. But as we also understand that there was need for more innovation, a need for fine-tuning the treatment, and so came the insulin analogs, and so as we've already mentioned, we have rapid-acting analogs, and we have long-acting analogs, and of these, glargin still across the world uh, uh, seems to be the most favored long-acting insulin analog. So in terms of biosimilar glargin, what is the strength of data that is available before us? Well, I must admit that uh, not myself, but my department has been involved in some of these studies, more the clinical studies, which we'll come to later, not the pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic studies, uh, which have looked at uh, the properties of biosimilar insulin glargin from Wokert, particular company. Uh, so when we talk of bioequivalence of biosimilar company or, or any molecule, both the US FDA and the European Medical uh, Agency, they agree that you look at log ratio, the geometric means of log ratio of at least two properties in, in terms of pharmacokinetics. That is, pharmacokinetics is very simply what the body does to the molecule that you put in, and pharmacodynamics is what the, that molecule does to the body. So 
you look at the area under the curve over a period of time, what's the level of insulin that is achieved, and you also look at the C max, the maximum concentration that is achieved, and you decide or you conclude that this is acceptable quality if the 90% confidence interval of the geometric mean of the log ratio of these parameters fall between 80% and 125% or in ratios between 0.8 and 1.2. And so this was Wachard Glargin and this is Innovator Glargin. And you see, whether it's area under the curve or Cmax, it exactly matches the desirable properties. And then if you look at pharmacodynamic properties, this now looks at the glucose infusion rate. So how do you assess in, 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 in these studies, equivalent studies? You inject a given amount of this insulin. What is it supposed to cause? It is supposed to lower your glucose levels. So what you do is infuse glucose from outside, try and maintain the glucose levels at a steady state, and the infusion rate will sort of be a reflection of the insulin action. So if the insulin is causing more glucose uh, drop, then you need to push in more glucose from outside. So more glucose you need to put means sort of more effect of the insulin in the system. So for this and also the glucose infusion rate maximum and the area under the curve for glucose infusion rate. Again, if you look at the figures, the 90% confidence interval, they again fall very well within the defined or accepted 0.8 to 1.25. And then this is between subject variation. One of the, proper, one of the problems that at least I face in any insulin preparation is the same insulin in the same individual day to day giving rise to different levels of glucose. We of course ascribe that to a lot to what the patient does, the patient eats, the patient doesn't exercise, patient is more stressed on a day, but it may also be related, the concern is it may also be related to the product that you are injecting. So we need to be assured that whether we look at between subject variation or within subject variation, again, if we compare the innovator glargin to Wachard's glargin, there is hardly anything to choose between the two. And then if we look at the same in a graphical form, which is maybe easier to appreciate, again, this is pharmacokinetic data, this is pharmacodynamic data. If you look at the insulin concentration, they match quite well the innovator glargin and Wachard glargin. And then again, if you look at the glucose infusion rate as reflecting the pharmacodynamic activity, again, it's very well matching the, the two insulins. So, and this is in response to a single subcutaneous injection of 0.4 units per kg of uh, uh, the insulin in healthy subjects. And this is... Uh, uh, something that we had been part of, our department has been part of looking at the efficacy in, in, in actually patients with type 2 diabetes. And if you look at efficacy in terms of ability to lower A1Cs, again, it's very similar between the two insulins, uh, p-value 0.454. And if you look at uh, more specifically, Looking at the fasting glucose levels, again, there is no significant difference, though it does look to be slightly different, but there's no statistical difference. And if you look at patients with change in glargin dose from baseline, and this is a crossover study. First, maybe in one subject, the innovator insulin is given, and the second half, the biosimilar insulin, and then you cross over to the other insulin. And you see if you are requiring different doses of insulin in order to reach particular glucose levels. Uh, the studies show there is no significant difference between the two. And what we are concerned is hypoglycemia. Again, if you look at hypoglycemia episodes,